our eyes looking down this way. Okay? Now the image flip-flops back and forth because it's neutral. It's a new, neutral image, which is interesting, but not the experiment. The experiment is if you show one group of subjects a stronger old woman image, and then you show the neutral one, they see the old, the old woman. If you show another group of subjects the young woman image first, you sort of prime the perceptual system, they call it. That's what it's called, priming the perceptual system. Show them the young woman image first, show the neutral, they'll see the young woman. So we are programmed, as it were, to see things in a certain way, particularly when the data are not clear, when it's fuzzy, when you can't quite make out what's going on, the mind fills in the blanks. Here's a, an interesting one, an idol of the tribe. The way our brains are designed, you simply, uh, you can't help but see the, the, can you see the dots? Is it working? The black and white dots are popping in and out? Okay. So, I, you know, this is another one of these fun things with middle school kids. You know, count the number of black dots and white dots. You know, there are no black dots and you, it, it's sort of very elusive. That's just built into our perceptual system. It doesn't matter that you know how it works and how the trick is done or whatever with magic. You, you still can't help but, but follow it. One of my favorites, and especially because he's here, Jerry Andrus, in this impossible crate, this is the, the, the simple version, the 2D version, the version you see in psychology textbooks, and you can see why it's impossible. The, the board in the back wraps around the board that's in the front and so forth, and it seems to flip-flop back and forth. Surely, however, you could not do that in three dimensions, but the amazing or astonishing Jerry Andrus, who is here, uh, in fact, he's back there in the corner with his illusions, uh, built one. He built an impossible crate, and there he is standing uh, in the impossible crate. Uh, and Jerry was kind enough, especially since he's already did the, done the reveal, to show us the reveal. If you could, many of you already know how this is done, but of course, camera angle is everything. The picture is taken from over here and shot that way. Very clever, but but when you go back, you see it's it's really quite impossible to see. You know that the rope has a the rope has a wire in it to make it bend and so forth, and. Uh, so this is one of these idols of the tribe. We're just, it, the human brain is built in a certain way. You just can't help but get around seeing things a certain way. Of course, the famous uh, face on Mars. We see faces because uh, the face is the probably single most important revealer of emotions and social relationships. And it's the first thing you imprint on and bond with after you're born. Faces are vitally important. So of course we see faces even when they're not really there. You can kind of make the face out, the gash and the nose and the eyes and so on in the new and improved photograph. But you can find faces elsewhere, the happy face on Mars. <laughs> If astronomers were frogs, idols of the cave, they would see images such as Kermit the Frog. <laughs> you see Kermit? There he is, his head, his little mouth, and his little legs down here. Okay. Uh, if astronomers were cats, some of these are from Phil's uh, webpage. Uh, you see the cat down here? Uh, where is he? There? Huh? Here's a cat sitting there. If geologists were elephants, this, I believe, is up here in Red Rocks, right, uh, just about 25 miles from here, up in the Nevada mountains. If geologists were sponsored by McDonald's, <laughs> we see things, of course, that we're interested in. E.T., the extraterrestrial cereal. Somebody actually found a cereal that kind of looks like E.T. This stuff sells on eBay. <laughs> Idols of the theater. That is, these sort of fictional things. Religious icons are particularly powerful in this regard. Uh, kind of see the face of uh, Jesus here. Here it is, highlighted in case you miss it, the face of Jesus. This I got from uh, Phil, who said, actually, there's a web page devoted to this. The famous nun bun is one of my favorites. <laughs> The nun bun was discovered in 1996 by a Tennessee baker who laminated it and put it on display and sold tickets for people to see until he got a letter from Mother Teresa's lawyer. <laughs> Even Mother Teresa is not above having a lawyer saying, cease and desist, selling the image. <laughs> it's pretty good, though. This one just came down the pike, the Jesus tooth filling. This one's kind of hard to see if you squint a little bit, but basically this is the nose, eye, eye, nose, and the mouth is here, and kind of a beard. Is a, is a, can you see it? It's kind of, if you squint, and, and the, this is his hair coming down here, so the, it's, the whole thing is the head. 
the Jesus tooth filling. Uh -huh. Of course, uh, the lady of Guadalupe and the lady of Watsonville, California, there she is at the treat. My uh, Virgin Mary in Sao Paulo, of course, the famous cheese sandwich. The $28,000 grilled cheese sandwich bought by a online gambling casino. Um, Pat Lindsay pointed out something very interesting. No Virgin Mary, uh, in the Virgin Mary iconography, none of them ever looks sort of like a cute uh, girl looking up. She's looking up or out. M Marys are always very modest, looking away with the hair covered and so on. She's kind of like a, I don't know, a Shirley Temple or a or a, I, I don't know, a Sharon Stone or something. Not, not a it's the Sharon Stone cheese sandwich or something. <laughs> of course, the, my favorite is the Virgin Mary in Clearwater, Florida, on the side of the bank building, which has now apparently been vandalized, and believers go to be healed. Richard, you'll remember our little trip with Randy and myself, Richard, here, and just to kind of give you a feel for how big this thing is, several stories high. There was so much wax on the ground from the candles, thousands of candles, that they had to sprinkle that uh, auto shop granulated stuff to soak up grease so you don't slip and fall. They were taking donations to pay the mortgage. It was a 10, they paid $10 million for this building, and the mortgage was something like $10,000 a month. Uh, since then, somebody shot, I guess, shot uh, some pellets through it or something and wrecked it. Of course, if you walk around, you find these fuzzy images wherever there's a sprinkler and a palm tree. Turns out Clearwater isn't. It's, uh, it's kind of a heavily mineralized uh, water that leaves stains on the building. There was a nice Virgin Mary on the back that they started to wipe off. You can only have one miracle per building, I guess. <laughs> and so, again, it, it's this question of uh, pattern-seeking behavior and uh, the signal in the noise. Is it all noise? And the apparent signal, is it a real signal or is it just m my mind? Am I seeing it only in my mind? Is it an icon of, is it is an idol of the cave in my mind or is it something? Is it really a miracle of Mary or is it a miracle of Marge? <laughs> I'm not very religious as you know, I'm certainly not Catholic, but I am a huge Simpsons fan, so that's, that's what I saw when I saw it. <laughs> The smartest show on television. <laughs> uh, idols are, again, cognitive biases. The confirmation bias, I think, is one of the most useful tools. We'll go over several here this morning. Uh, this, is all from, this is all from the first chapter, the introduction of the, of the new book. Uh, I played a psychic for a day for Bill Nye, the science guy. I did, a, I did a astrological reading, tarot card reading, palm reading, and a medium talking to the dead reading. It, it turns out it's really easy to talk to the dead. <laughs> it's getting them to talk back that's the hard part. And... <laughs> And you do it with these various tools here, and as long as the people believe uh, that you can do it, then their confirmation bias kicks in. Confirmation bias is where you look for, you seek and find confirmatory evidence for what you already believe, and you ignore all disconfirmatory evidence. Everybody does it. We do it in science. We do it in politics. We do it in social life. The difference is science has a mechanism to weed out the confirmation bias. We'll come back to that. One of my favorites when I was growing up uh, when I was, I think, 13 or 14 in middle school, uh, was that Paul McCartney had died. And there are various theories about how he had died, motorcycle accident, or he was decapitated in a car accident or something. And we all began hearing about clues embedded in the various Beatles albums. Uh, so I just popped a few of these here. This is this from the famous Sgt. Pepper's uh, album here. And there's two sets of Beatles, the new Beatles and sort of the doer old Beatles as if they're you know, at a funeral, and this is kind of a funereal setting here with the flowers, and there's this fellow here uh, with his hand over Paul's head, and this is like some sort of Middle Eastern sign of death or something like this, and this is like a dead child with Paul's bloody glove here, their first bloody glove, and uh, anyway, and it's just sort of, once you start looking for this stuff, this is...